Thank you, Rob. And, and thank you particularly to, to Rob Sansom and Robin Beck and the organizers here. It's a great honor to have all of your attention for this short amount of time. So that's my title. And the su substance of this talk, actually the title is a bit misleading because these first two bits don't really uh, comprise part of the title and they're not in the abstract at all. But you know, I figured it, you might be interested. The first bit is more of a public service announcement that leads into this second bit. And the third bit is really where the, the title is relevant. But let me unpack these three bits. First of which being the one tree. And this, this is a, a kind of a public service announcement. What I want to do in the next few slides is to convince you that we shouldn't, unless you're talking about a gene tree, we should be talking about phylogenetic trees, not molecular trees, not morphological trees. Let me unpack that. And uh, the evolutionary process itself predicts that there is really just one tree. Right? There isn't a molecular tree. There isn't a morphological tree. These are all adjectives that should be used to describe the data that we use to build the one tree. And this is important because um, you can use different bodies of data yielding congruent trees to test if evolution actually happened. I know that's, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like telling architects that you have to retest gravity every time you build a bridge, which is sort of ridiculous. But when you do have an interface with the public, as many of you do, um, I, th I think it is an important point. So the one tree is something that is uh, actually, it's not new. And so this is a, a screenshot of a publication from 1872 by an author who would never misspell chondrichthians. You can tell that I'm a mammalogist. Um, but his Theodore Gill's part of this image is all the, the black stuff here, the red bits and the misspellings are mine. Um, but what I want to point out here is that this is a tree of vertebrates and it's extraordinarily accurate by today's standards. Remember, this is not a Photoshop thing. This is his image uh, from 1872. So he has uh, uh, the lancelet at the base of the tree, his monophyletic cyclostomes, he has a cartilaginous uh, fish, a cartilaginous clade, he has a bony fish clade. He even has lungfish and coelacanths pectinate at the base of tetrapods. So, you know, based on today's standards, this is extraordinarily accurate. There are 18 terminals here um, that he resolved, a few that he didn't, like uh, sturgeons and some acanthodians. But given the ones that he did resolve, that's the number of possible bifurcating rooted trees that he could have come up with. And so this is really one out of an astronomically large number of trees that he could have come up with, but he came up with this one. So if we look then um, at uh, modern trees like this concatenation of nuclear DNA from Hugal in college in 2007, in the essential details of vertebrate phylogeny, it is essentially the same. It is very, very similar. And I would like to draw your attention to this paper from 1982 by Penny, Foulds, and uh, Hendy, in which they state what I've already mentioned briefly, the theory of evolution predicts that similar phylogenetic trees should be obtained from different sets of character data. In that particular case, they were looking at amino acid sequences from five different proteins, but the same idea, the same principle applies to, comparing, to looking at a comparative anatomically derived phylogenetic tree and a phylogenetic tree derived from a source of data that Theodore Gill didn't know existed in 1872, and they're the same. And this is a really important point because we can use this to talk to our creationist uncle at, you know, at Christmas dinner um, uh, and, and say, well, you know, this is one of the many reasons why we can have confidence in this evolutionary process. Um, Okay, so there's another aspect of my public service announcement to, to hit, to belabor this point even more. Consider a paper that made a big impact back in 2007, Organ et al. And what Organ et al. did back then was estimate genome size in a variety of different vertebrates. And they found that extinct volant vertebrates and extant volant vertebrates, things like uh, pterosaurs and extinct birds and extinct bats, um, and living volant vertebrates had really small genomes. Now, how can you tell the genome size in an animal that's been extinct for 150 million years, like this, this allosaur bone cross section? Well, you look at the morphology of its bone cells. Now, consider the ridiculousness of referring to the genome of an allosaur as a morphological genome. No one would do that. And by that same logic, I would submit to you that when you have 
a phylogenetic species tree that's based on molecular data, we shouldn't refer to that as a molecular phylogeny. The phylogeny itself exists, the one true tree, for vertebrates at least, exists whether or not anyone in this room is around to see it. It is independent of our perception and we reconstruct it using different bodies of data, which of course are mole molecules, morphology, et cetera. Anyways, so uh, these are the adjectives that you shouldn't use to describe a phylogeny. These are the ones that you that you should use to describe, I'm sorry, a tree. Um, so that's my, my public service announcement. And as I mentioned already, engineers don't have to um, you know, retest gravitation every time they design a bridge in the same way. I'm not necessarily arguing that, that we have to retest evolution by looking at uh, independent bodies of data and seeing if they yield congruent estimates of the one true tree. Um, but we should remember that we don't have to assume evolution when we reconstruct phylogeny. Um, so that segues then into, and I keep hitting the wrong direction on this little doohickey, um, that segues into the second part of my talk, which is uh, data combination and hidden support. Given the fact that we don't have to retest evolution every time, um, for a variety of reasons, in my opinion, as I'll try to make the case now, I actually think it's, a, it's generally speaking, uh, the, you know, with a few qualifications, the optimal strategy is always to combine data, or usually to combine data. And I want to cite a paper by, paper by John Gatesy and, and Rick Baker from 2005, in which they used an analogy of the United States Electoral College system. And back in 2005, you know, the, the tree-hugging liberals were whining about, myself included, about the results of that 2000 election, and it has only gotten worse. The basic problem with the US Electoral College system is that it takes arbitrary political boundaries and uses that as a basis for partitioning data. The data in the case of the US College, uh, the US Electoral College are voters like me, right? I'm, I'm a citizen of Her Majesty just as I am a citizen of the US. I, I pay taxes and vote in both places. And my vote in the state of New York has about, um, one third, less than one third the electoral impact as a voter in the state of Wyoming. And that is a direct result of these arbitrary state boundaries. Some of them say between Idaho and Montana apparently resulted from surveyor errors because the, the guys in the 1840s or wherever were supposed to go on the continental divide, but they got confused at the Bitterroot Range. And that's why we have a very narrow uh, Idaho panhandle. And in any event, what an awful reason to partition data is that not? And what I want to try to convince you is that the partitions that we see in biology, while not perhaps quite as arbitrary as the, the boundary between northern Idaho and Montana, are nonetheless arbitrary enough so that we shouldn't perpetuate them. So these uh, biological partitions, in, in my opinion, are the result of not of intrinsic features of biology, but of our lab techniques that you know, we can observe sequences of nucleotides or expression of developmental genes in development or foramina in a skull. And all of those things share, in the words of Lee Van Valen from a 1982 paper defining homology, all of these things share a continuity of information. In, you know, and, and whether we perceive this continuous evolutionary information at a very early stage in development or at a very late, you know, that, that results from our own traditions as, as biologists and, and paleontologists, et cetera. So um, this enables me now to, to talk a little bit more about some of the nitty gritty of combining data and attempting to infer something about the uh, relative information content of the partitions that we can, if, you know, we'll combine them eventually, but we can still look at their individual contributions to a given tree. And this, what I'm talking about here is hidden branch support. And again, I want to cite John Gatesy and his 1999 paper that defined this among other kinds of, of branch support. So here's a hypothetical evolutionary tree and you see um, these numbers represent in a parsimony context, uh, the number of steps you need to break apart that given clade. And hidden support is not of phenomenon just a parsimony. It is equally applicable in a probabilistic context, although it's more intuitive to talk about it uh, with, with parsimony. So hidden branch support refers to the situation in which um, if we have, say, gene one, gene two, we look at their, their, the topologies that they generate separately, 
And you could note, for example, that this clade F through E here in the first partition has a support index of five. In the second one, it's one. But the combined data is not the sum of those two, that the combined data have actually stronger branch support than, than you would expect from the sum of the constituent parts. And that's an example of positive hidden branch support. There are also examples when branch support can go down or uh, indeed stay additive. And you can do this across every node uh, for all the various partitions that you happen to have in a given data set. Um, hidden support can consist of uh, two different things. The intuitive one are the characters that are, it's a bit like the electoral college, right? If you, if, I, if you humor me for a moment and let me take that analogy a step further, imagine a system in which there are many, many different candidates for president in the US system and every state has a 51% majority for a, a different candidate. And every state has a 49% minority for the same candidate. The losing candidate will have a massive uh, uh, popular vote victory if you just add up and get rid of these artificial partitions and yet in, the, in such a hypothetical electoral college system will have lost. That 49% minority in each individual partition is roughly consistent or analogous to this mutually amplified signal across partitions, right? That's the sort of positive synergetic side of the coin of hidden support. Whereas there's another side of this coin in which uh, simple noise can, can um, decrease support widely across different nodes in a given phylogeny. By chance, there'll be a few clades that won't be as negatively supported. And simply by virtue of this influx of noise, hidden support can actually increase as well. And I want to unpack that a little more. Um, I want to do so by looking at this 2009 paper by Lee, Mike Lee, and Commons uh, in Journal of Evolutionary Biology, in which they took what at the time was a fairly big uh, uh, nucleotide data set and a, a morphological data set of mine, and they combined the two. Um, as it happens with high-level mammalian clades in the Linna arbitrary Linnaean uh, ranks, that's the, you know, we talk about mammalian orders, um, comparative anatomy has done very well in reconstructing uh, species and genera and families and, and even high, levels higher than that, it has done very well in enabling us to recognize the topology of vertebrates, to distinguish amniotes from non-amniotes and many other parts of the vertebrate tree. Um, but in terms of orders of mammals, and I think all of you here have, been, uh, have heard of these things like hippo whale or aphrotheria, that wouldn't have been evident from just comparative anatomy. So there are cases where the comparative anatomy uh, including this data set of mine, does not reconstruct accurately the interordinal relations among placental mammals. But Lee and Commons point out that when they combined this particular morphological data set with a large uh, sequence alignment, the, these novel clades like Aphrotheria and Whipomorpha, the support indices actually go up, even though that isolated partition, morphology in this case, uh, contradicts such interordinal relationships by itself. And they interpreted this by saying that idiosyncratic homoplasy in independent data sets cancels out, right? So that's the 51% the majority, if I may continue that electoral college analogy a bit more, the 51% majority for different candidates cancels out once you get rid of the partitions. So they were emphasizing the positive aspect of, of synergy, which is perfectly legitimate and I think uh, correct in, in many regards in that case. But they didn't look at, at least I don't think they did, um, the negative aspect of, of hidden support. And this is, again, what I mentioned a moment ago. That's my acronym for hidden branch support, HBS. It's, it's a very important concept. It's a shame that the acronym is BS, because on the contrary, it's very, you know, this is not bullshit. This is really um, a, legitimate, uh, a legitimate means to measure the contribution of, of, of different data sets to a given phylogeny. Anyways, hidden branch support, here's the definition that the Branch support across nodes in an in a, in a unpartitioned analysis um, minus the sum of branch supports for a given clade across the isolated partitions. And if you imagine that each one of these, you know, a clade doesn't appear in any of these partitions, this is going to be a very large negative number. And when you subtract a large negative number, you get a very large positive number. This is what I'm talking about in terms of what Gatesy et al. 1999 referred to as the dispersion of homoplasy. And so some colleagues of mine, Rick Thompson and Ava Baumann, back in 2012, um, unpacked this a little bit 
And uh, what we wanted to do is, is look at, at the time, what we thought was a reasonably comprehensive list of papers that had, had made their data available to the extent that we could calculate the partitioned support indices from various uh, data sources. And it's not just mammals in this case. We have some plants, a bunch of insects, there's birds, there's butterflies, and some, some uh, sauropsids there as well. Um, and we wanted to see if this negative uh, um, kind of, of hidden branch support, this dispersion of homoplasia, is, is this happening a lot or, or, or is it rare? And so what we did is we took some uh, randomized data partitions. And you can't completely randomize it because then you won't be able to get an optimal tree for that data partition. You'll end up with a totally flat tree space and the parsimony algorithms in our case would never yield an optimal tree. So what we did instead were things like take morphology for polychaete worms and combine them with a, with a sequence data set for mammals. Or we took the sequence data set for one of these uh, groups and just randomized the taxon names. So a bunch of analyses like that. And what we found is that the, the ratio, and, and please pardon the, the jargon here, but the ratio of the hidden branch support as a, as a unit of total support was quite low in the real data sets. That's what these red bars mean. You can barely see it there because it's so low. That's the case there and there. Whereas in our randomized uh, analyses, this, this hidden branch support was so high, and the total support, when I mean by that, is adding up all the branch supports in the given analysis, um, actually decreases when you contribute a randomized partition. And so this was to us an indication that our randomized data sets were actually behaving quite differently than, than the real ones. So the conclusion of the second part of the talk is that real data partitions across animal groups share historical signal, consistent with what Lee and Commons were saying, consistent with what Gatesy had all said in, in 1999. And relatedly, the real data partitions uh, behave differently than when ones that are randomized. And so we were reasonably confident that um, what has been published so far about hidden support and identifying synergy is, is correct. OK, last part of my talk. I've, I've, Rob, you'll look at me in a stern way if I'm exceeding my allotted time. So um, this is the, the bit that actually shows up in, in the title and in the abstract. And I want to discuss here this issue of statistical, statistical consistency of morphological data in systematics. This is what paleo, us paleontologists um, uh, uh, work with. And strictly speaking, this is the symposium of anatomy and paleontology, um, or of paleontology and comparative anatomy, SVPCA. So someone here may not necessarily be a paleontologist is what I'm trying to say. In any event, um, many of us work with, the, uh, with morphological data. And the question is, given some knowledge as to what the well-corroborated tree is, which I'm very happy to say that we have today, not just mammals, but a lot of groups out there have well-corroborated trees. The question is, as you add more and more data, can you have more, correspondingly more confidence that you're getting the uh, in, increase in accuracy, that you're getting a correct tree? And in the last few months, year, actually, I've been thinking a lot about rodents in, in collaboration with my colleague Amy Rankin in my department at the University of Cambridge and Bob Emery, curator at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. And uh, we are working on this, this phylogeny of glearies. And that's the well-corroborated tree of glearies. You have lagomorphs, a sister taxon to a rodent clade, consisting of a bunch of clades within that that we can talk about uh, uh, later if you're interested in. And just to give you an example of what statistical consistency looks like in a body of data, um, here it is. This is not morphology yet. I'll get to that in a moment. But what you're looking at here is a y-axis that represents um, one of the asymmetric constituents of Robinson folds, right? This is just how many changes do you have to make to get two trees to be a, the same? So the higher the Robinson folds number, the, the more different two trees are. You'll notice that I have negative numbers here because I want the top of all these graphs to be good and the bottom to be bad. So it's zero minus um, this part of Robinson folds here. So the higher you are on this graph, the, the, the more similar you are to my standard here, which is a well-corroborated tree of rodents. And what you're looking at on the x-axis are percentage resampling of a, of a sequence data set that's about 18,000 bases long, ranging from 0.01% sample to 90% sample. And as you see, as I resample from 0.01%, about 200 bases to almost all of the 18,000, you get more, you know, you get an asymptote. 
That's statistically consistent data, at least with the qualification that my standard for accuracy, which is largely based on um, this rare genomic event paper by Chirikov et al. 2010, so a data set that's independent from the largely coding nuclear and, and mitochondrial genes um, that, that represent this, this alignment that's being resampled here. So that's statistically consistent data. <coughs> Gesundheit. Um, so here we have now some examples from anatomical data, or at least examples that are discussing the statistical consistency of anatomical data. And, um, you know, poor Rob has had to listen to me talk about primates over and over again at symposia for the last, I don't know how long has it been now, three years? I guess it's been an honor every time, Dr. Sansom. So in any event, uh, here's my primate photo again that you've seen many times. Um, and what this is showing you is a variety of fossil templates ranging from about 10% complete here at this side of the graph to about 90% complete over here, and taking modern living taxa where we know where they belong. Every, we know that a macaque is a cercopithecine uh, a catarine primate. It's not a strepsirine primate. It's not a coligo. It's not a tree shrew. And the question is, if we take the data that we know from an awful fossil like Wylechia in a dapiform from Southeast Asia that's about 8% complete using a particular character matrix, can we accurately place a macaque in the primate tree of life? And of course, the, what this is telling you is that the poorly complete or the, the not so complete fossils are not doing as well as the more complete fossils in reconstructing living taxa with known phylogenetic affinities. That is statistical consistency. So this, for paleontologists, this is pretty good news. There are also these y-axis error bars because in each one of these cases I have an array of these uh, 26 different living fossils that on the x-axis are being uh, examined for a given fossil template. So the same graphs here are repeated for a placental mammal data set um, and then another uh, pair of placental mammal data sets, one of which is O'Leary et al. 2013, a very big one that s several of you have been working with quite closely. Um, and in every case, or at least these cases, it's, it's not quite as uh, obvious as with the primate example, but this is a statistically significant fit of this line with a very significant uh, p-value indicating that as you get more and more complete with your fossil templates, the, the accuracy on the y-axis here goes up. Um, and similarly, the y-axis error bars, uh, it's not quite as obvious with the placental data sets, but they are shorter on this end of the graph compared to this end. So that's with the non-rodents. Here's what we get with the rodents. The, the general conclusion about accuracy is the same. The poorly known fossils down here uh, yield topologies that are uh, slightly less consistent with the well-corroborated tree than the templates with a lot of data. But what's different about the rodents that you'll perhaps notice is that these um, y-axis error bars don't really get any narrower at the more complete end of the spectrum. And I want to unpack that a little bit. It's largely, I, I have to be honest with you, of course, as we all are when we attend these, these, these talks, and share with you the fact that for some t species, it's hard to reconstruct their phylogenetic affinities. I mean, if it were easy, we wouldn't be having symposia like this. Um, and the two culprits in this case are uh, Pedetes capensis and Anomalurus b. cruftii. And what I'm showing you here is not the uh, fossil templates on the x-axis, but the living subject taxa, just organized by their uh, decreasing success in being used as subject taxa when you reconstruct uh, their phylogenetic affinities using only data from fossils. So these two animals, Pedetes and Anomalurus, are the least successful taxa, that means when I only have 20% uh, of the anatomical data for Anomalurus, I delete the mitochondrial and the nuclear data. Most of the time, Anomalurus is showing up somewhere with our guinea pig clade or our squirrel clade, not where it's supposed to be, and the same thing is true with Pedetes. If I delete those two taxa, um, I do get a significant decrease of variation from less complete to more complete. Um, but, you know, that's just because I have the advantage of knowing about Anomalurus and Pedetes because they're not fossils. I know where they, where they uh, are in the living tree. So this is a problem because we don't have that kind of information in real paleontological systematic uh, questions. Okay. Um, now, I want to approach this issue of statistical consistency uh, in a slightly different way in the last couple slides that I have. And this is not by taking a fossil template and deleting the, the, uh, the 
non-fossilizable data and giving subject tax on. Rather, it is taking the same graph that I showed you a moment ago with percent characters sampled from a, uh, a mitochondrial nuclear sequence alignment from 0.01% to 90%. And with a measure of accuracy on the y-axis, so the higher you are on, that, on this scale, the more similar you are to the well-corroborated tree. And this is for, for the rodents. Um, just to remind you, we've already gone over this. As you see, as you sample more and more of these nucleotides, you get more and more similar to the well-corroborated tree. What happens if I were to add my relatively, so I have 18,000 aligned nucleotides, about 220 morphological characters. What happens if I add those morphological characters to all of these different analyses? Well, things get better. The, the uh, DNA only uh, analyses are these black um, dots here, and the DNA indels and morphology are the red ones. And as you get for very large sampling, then the, the y-axis error bars tend to overlap, but they don't overlap down here. So with a small sequence data set, it really improves accuracy, at least given my standard of accuracy on the y-axis, the Cherikov et al. Uh, data set. Um, so this is another, in my interpretation, uh, demonstration of the historical phylogenetic signal that's present in paleontologically accessible data, namely uh, hard tissues, bones, and teeth. Last couple slides, um, and this is another attempt at getting at the information content and asking is anatomical data statistically consistent. Instead of resampling 0.1% to 90% of a given morphological matrix, um, what I've done here is I've kept the y-axis you know, a, a similar index of similarity to a, the well-corroborated tree, but on the x-axis, I'm adding in fossils. So I have, a, in this case, a 60 taxon uh, character set of all, these 60 taxa are all living, and here I've added five fossils. Here I've added 10, 15, 20, et cetera, and I've asked the question, does this increase similarity to the well-corroborated tree? As, it do, as you see, it does in a highly significant way. So the analysis here with 30 fossils or 35 fossils is much better, statistically speaking, than the analyses with five or 10 fossils. So again, statistical consistency coming out of, of an anatomical data set. Of course, I have to be totally honest with you and, and share with you the fact that when I use a, a more uh, a larger sample of a well-corroborated tree. In other words, instead of these 32 taxa from Chirikov, I use all 60 taxa, then the results are not quite so straightforward. So this is actually not a significant fit. Adding more taxa does not increase the similarity, at least statistically speaking, um, it, when I use Robinson folds itself. When I use one of the subcomponents of Robinson folds, the ace, one of the two asymmetric differences that I've circled here in red, I get a graph that looks much like this um, and a highly significant p-value. So let me then conclude two things that I've told you. First of all, um, there is one historical tree of life, certainly for vertebrates, some qualification about population level reticulations or maybe mul you know, multiple <laughs> origins. Um, and partly for that reason, uh, we should use phylogenetic as an adjective for tree, not molecular, not morphological. And then these other two conclusions, combining data partitions is good. And then finally, there is demonstrable historical signal in comparative anatomical uh, data sets um, that succeed in, in reconstructing parts of the tree that are, that are well known. And with that, I will thank you all very much for your attention. <laughs>